1948, the State of Israel was founded after the expulsion of the indigenous population of Palestine. Specifically, the founding of the State of Israel was the direct result of operations carried out by the Israeli Founding Fathers that resulted in the emptying of 11 urban districts, the destruction of over half of all Palestinian villages, and the expulsion of 80% of the indigenous population, which numbers around 800,000 people, expelled from their homes with no right of return. A number of historians have made the case that this Nakba, as this event is referred to, encompasses ethnic cleansing as defined by the United Nations. So that's our topic of discussion for today. The fact that this mass expulsion took place is not a coincidence. It wasn't something that was incidental to the creation of the State of Israel. Rather, it was a very deliberate military strategy that was meticulously planned out for years before being executed. It was believed by the Israeli founding fathers to be essential to the founding of their state. We're going to look at explicit statements and writings of the founders of Israel that clearly illustrate the extent to which they were obsessed with the removal of Arabs from what they considered rightfully their land. So often we hear the refrain that the Israel-Palestine conflict is very complex and cannot be understood by outsiders, but this is far from the case. It is in fact a very simple and straightforward conflict, and it will become clear as we go on that the story of Israel is one that we have heard many times before. It is the story of Europeans engaging in settler colonialism and forcibly removing, imprisoning, and killing half the indigenous population. This was done in the United States, in Australia, in Canada, in South Africa, and of course in Israel. There's never anything new under the sun. It's all been done before. A lot of people here are probably aware to some extent of the origins of Zionism. But to summarize, Zionism is a national movement and ideology that calls for the establishment of the Jewish state in what we call Palestine. Zionism was initiated by a mixture of Jewish people believing that their abhorrent treatment in Europe had gone too far that Jewish people needed a country of their own, and by anti-Semitic Europeans who believed that Jewish people could not assimilate in Europe, they should be given land somewhere else to settle. It was a divisive issue within the Jewish community, with sides being taken on both sides of the argument. But it wasn't a solid movement yet. It was still what we call proto-Zionism. The, idea, the, the ideas were there, but they hadn't been assimilated into a coherent ideology or movement yet. What truly started the Zionist movement was the Dreyfus Affair. Captain Alfred Dreyfus was accused of treason and sentenced to jail, with many believing him to be innocent and the victim of anti-Semitism, which was true, by the way. The Dreyfus Affair shocked many Jewish people across the continent, as France was one of the first countries to give Jewish people equality under the law. And if something this overtly anti-Semitic could take place over there, the situation was not looking good for Jewish people in more despotic regions of Europe, like Tsarist Russia, where Jewish people were ghettoized and terrorized by pogroms for decades. Zionism emerged as a secular Jewish movement for a return to Eretz Israel, which was the Jewish name for Palestine. Some Zionists saw Palestine as being occupied by strangers that had to be dealt with in order to repossess Eretz Israel. Stranger, of course, referring to anyone who wasn't Jewish and who had been living in Palestine since the Roman occupation, which was somewhere around uh, the early uh, first century. Other Zionists saw Palestine as being empty a land without a people, the Palestinians being either invisible or something akin to wildlife of an empty land to be conquered and removed. If that sounds familiar, it's a common trope among settler colonial beliefs, the most prominent example being the indigenous population of Australia, officially considered flora and fauna by the colonial government. Before 1917, Zionism was vastly limited in its scope. It consisted of colonies of Europeans in Palestine, who only formed 5% of the population by 1918, contrasted with a much higher percentage of about 30% in 1948. As to how the Palestinians viewed the nascent Zionist movement, there was some evidence of discussion by Palestinian leaders regarding the Zionist movement, and for the most part it seemed like they were seen as a, colo as a colonialist or a missionary venture that sought to buy lands, assets, and power in Palestine, but not as a world-ending threat. But so far, that was truly the extent of the Zionist movement, buying land, resources, and assets, and forming social and communal networks between colonies. But all this was to change with the entrance of the British. In 1917, the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Arthur Balfour, wrote a letter promising the Zionist movement on behalf of the British government 
that a country would be established in Palestine for the Jewish people. This is often called the Balfour Declaration. Following the end of World War II in 1918, the British were given control over Palestine by the League of Nations, quote, until such time as they're able to stand alone. The British attempted to institute a parliament with Jewish colonists and Palestinians equally represented, which was of course ludicrous given the fact that the Palestinians made up 80 to 90 percent of the population. This along with many other factors led to the British mandate over Palestine being rife with uprisings, rebellions and riots. One of these rebellions in 1936 was so popular among the Palestinian people that the British stationed more troops in Palestine than in British India at the time. The rebellion led to the exile of the Palestinian leadership and the crippling of the militancy of the Palestinian people due to arrests, injuries and deaths. Between the two major rebellions in 1929 and 1936, the Zionist leader had developed a plan for a Palestine with an exclusive Jewish presence. As Ilan Pape states in his book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, the geographical space the Zionist movement coveted may have changed with time and according to circumstances and opportunities, but the principal objective remained the same. The Zionist project could only be realized through the creation in Palestine of a purely Jewish state, both as a safe haven for Jews from persecution and a cradle for a new Jewish nationalism. And such a state had to be exclusively Jewish, not only in its socio-political structure, but also in its ethnic composition. The British mandate gave permission to the Zionist movement to form its own political structures within their enclaves in Palestine to serve as a basis for a future state. The Zionist movement used this time to develop and prepare its plans to implement a state with Jewish exclusivity, developing military plans in case the land would not be granted to them diplomatically. Specifically, they were developing the military arm of their movement, the Haganah. The Haganah is the military wing of the Zionist movement was trained extensively in combat tactics and retaliation methods in the Judean wilderness by a man called Ord Wingate, who was an officer in the British Army. They received the chance to implement this training in their revolts in Palestine. These solo missions first involved taking out roadside snipers, punishing thieves who stole from their colonies. But their most formative experience was when Wingate arranged for them to accompany British troops to a Palestinian village which they seized and held for a few hours. In addition to this, many Haganah members served the British during the Second World War, gaining experience on that front. However, within Palestine, there was a very important intelligence operation that the Haganah was engaged in, the creation and maintenance of the Village Files. The Village Files was an initiative suggested by Ben Zion Luria, who was an employee of the Educational Department of the Jewish Agency that aimed at documenting all the Arab villages in Palestine in detail. Seemingly an innocuous plan when stated like that, you can imagine it almost as a census if you close your eyes to the next 60 plus years of brutality that emerged from it. To quote once again from Ilan Pape, by the late 1930s this archive was almost complete. Precise details were recorded about the topographic location of each village, its access roads, quality of land, water springs, main sources of income, its socio-political composition, religious affiliation, names of its muhtars, its relationship with other villages, the age of men, 60 to 50, and many more. An individual category was an index of hostility towards the Zionist project, that is, decided by the level of the village's participation in the revolt of 1936. There was a list of everyone who had been involved in the revolt, the families of those who had lost someone in the fight against the British. Particular attention was given to people who had allegedly killed Jews. As we shall see in 1948, as we shall see in 1948, these last bits of information fueled the worst atrocities in the villages, leading to mass executions and torture. It was obvious to all involved that this wasn't an academic study of the history of Palestine, but rather reconnaissance of enemy villages. One of the early operatives who was sent on these data excursion trips, called Mosh Pasternak stated, we had to study the basic structure of the Arab village. This means the structure and how best to attack it. In the military schools, I had been taught to attack a modern European city, not a primitive village in the Near East. We could not compare it, i.e. an Arab village, to a Polish or an Austrian one. The Arab village, unlike the European ones, was topographically built on hills. That meant we had to find out how best to approach the village from above 
or enter it from below. We had to train our Arabists, the Orientalists who operated a network of collaborators, how best to work with the informants. The worst part of these village files were updated one year before the Nakba. The creation of lists of wanted people in each village. The official criteria for placing people on this list was stated as involvement in the Palestinian national movement as leaders or its ideology. This was a very wide range of people, seeing as the Palestinian national movement and its leaders were members of various political parties that had won elections on both local and national levels. The fact of the matter was that the Zionists believed that the participation in the Palestinian government itself constituted a crime. The estimate is that in a village with 1,500 residents, around 25 to 30 people were placed on this list. A year later, many of the people on this list were given a summary execution, meaning they were executed with no trial or judge, on the spot when being accused. By the end of 1946, David Ben-Gurion, who was the founder of the Israeli state and its first prime minister, finalized a plan called Plan Dalit, which built off a previous plan that had listed punitive measures to be taken against Palestinians to deter them from attacking Jewish settlements. These punitive measures were killing the Palestinian political leadership, killing Palestinian insiders and their financial supporters, killing Palestinians who acted against Jews, killing senior Palestinian officers and officials, damaging Palestinian transportation, damaging the sources of Palestinian livelihoods, water, wells, mills, etc., attacking nearby Palestinian villages likely to assist in future attacks, attacking Palestinian clubs, coffee houses, meeting places, etc. Most interestingly, this plan stated that the targets of such killings could be found in the village files. It's almost as if the plan had always been the removal of Palestinians from Palestine. Statements from the leadership of the Zionist movement show how they believed there could be no stable Israel without a Jewish majority, with David Ben Gurion in writing, there are 40% non-Jews in the areas allocated to the Jewish state. This composition is not a solid basis for a Jewish state, and we have to face this new reality with all its severity and distinctness. Such a demographic balance questions our ability to maintain Jewish sovereignty. Only a state with 80% Jews is a viable and stable state. He had previously stated that immigration would not be a suitable method to reach this 80% lower limit, that force would have to be utilized to remove the Palestinians from Eretz Israel. When you look at statements from any leader of the Zionist movement at this time, they all express similar viewpoints, some even more severe. There is very little dissension, even the people considered the most liberal participants of the movement, such as Dr. Yaakov Dahon, were convinced by January 1948 that there could be no Jewish state without mass expulsions of the Palestinians. In February 1947, the British cabinet decided to pull out of Palestine and hand over the country to the UN to decide what to do next. The UN, for its part, deliberated for nine months and decided to partition the country into two, a Jewish state and a Palestinian state. The resolution was adopted by the UN on the 29th of November 1947. The ethnic cleansing of Palestine started a month later, in December 1947. A number of attacks by Jewish colonists on Palestinian villages and neighborhoods were done in retaliation to vandalism during Palestinian protests against the adoption of the resolution. These attacks were not an all-out war, but the Jewish attacks on Palestinians was severe enough at this stage to force 75,000 Palestinians out of their lands. By February of 1948, the Zionist movement had decided to move from retaliatory attacks to all-out ethnic cleansing. Forceful expulsions of Palestinians from their land had begun to ramp up, with five villages being emptied in only one day in mid-February. On March 10, 1948, Plan Dalit that called for the complete occupation of Palestine and the expulsion of the entire indigenous population by force was adopted with the first operation being the forceful occupation of Palestinian urban centers and the expulsion of the indigenous population by force. By the end of April, all these urban centers had been occupied and 250,000 Palestinians were expelled from them, followed by large-scale massacres such as the Deir Yassin massacre, where 107 Palestinian civilians, including women and children, were killed in a village of only 600 people. In Deir Yassin, some Palestinians were killed defending themselves in battle. Others were killed when they had surrendered or as they were running away. A number of prisoners were paraded around West Jerusalem and then killed. 
a report to the Israeli military intelligence stated, Some of the women and children were taken prisoner by the Lehi and transferred to Sheikh Bader. Among the prisoners were a young woman and a baby. The camp guards killed the baby before the mother's eyes and she fainted. They killed her too. This is a report to Israeli military intelligence. There is no reason they could be lying here. Jacques de Rainer, a representative of the Red Cross, described the aftermath of the massacre in his memoirs. A total of more than 200 dead, men, women, and children. About 150 cadavers had been preserved inside the village in view of the danger represented by the body's decomposition. They have been gathered, transported some distance, and placed in a large trough. I have not been able to establish if this is a pit, a grain silo, or a large natural excavation. One body was a woman who must have been eight months pregnant, hit in the stomach with powder burns on her dress, indicating she'd been shot point blank. He also stated many of the cadavers appeared to have been mutilated. In response to this horrible atrocity, the future sixth prime minister of Israel, who was present at this time, called the massacre a splendid act of conquest, and continued saying, tell the soldiers you have made history in Israel with your attack and your conquest. Continue thus until the victory. As in Deir Yassin, so everywhere, we will attack and smite the enemy. God, God, thou hast chosen us for conquest. In response, the Arab League decided to intervene militarily, but not until the British had officially withdrawn, which had happened on the 15th of May 1948, upon which the Zionist movement immediately declared the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine, immediately recognized by the USA and the USSR. The Arab League entered Palestine the next day. The U.S. offered Israel two peace plans to halt the escalation of violence, but both peace plans were rejected immediately. They had no plans for a Palestinian state to exist and wanted to occupy the entirety of Eretz Israel and had no reason to back down. Until May 1948, the Jewish army outnumbered the Palestinian irregular army by over 10 to 1. As the Arab League army entered the fray, the Jewish army still outnumbered them 2 to 1 and were more heavily armed and trained. The leaders of the Zionist movement pretended it was facing a doomsday scenario and that a second holocaust was imminent. This was all done for public spectacle. In private, the leaders of the Zionist movement were very well aware how unprepared, untrained and unarmed the Arab armies were. In response to a letter stating that the Zionist army only had enough troops to defend themselves but not take over a country, David Ben-Gurion replied, If we will receive in time the arms we have already purchased, maybe even some of that promised to us by the UN. We will be able not only to defend ourselves, but also to inflict death blows on the Syrians in their own country and take over Palestine as a whole. I am in no doubt of this. We can face all the Arab forces. This is not a mystical belief, but a cold and rational calculation based on practical examination. And we know they did just that, proving his statement to be correct. The fate of the Palestinian people was defined within the official plan adopted by the Zionist movement and was stated as follows. These operations can be carried out in the following manner, either destroying villages by setting fire to them, by blowing them up, and by planting mines in their rubble, especially those population centers that are difficult to control permanently, or by mounting, combing, and control operations according to the following guidelines, encirclement of villages, inducting a search inside them. In case of resistance, the armed forces must be wiped out and the population expelled outside the borders of the state. This was Plan Dalit. It was distributed to the commanders of the Haganah, along with a list of villages that each commander should target with his brigade. These were not vague guidelines, but clearly spelled out policies and orders for the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Plan Dalit was executed. Using the Deir Yassin massacre as a model, the end result was catastrophic. 800,000 people expelled, urban centers occupied, 500 plus villages destroyed, the relegation of the vast majority of Palestinian people as refugees or prisoners, and the death of 20,000 people. This is what started the Israel-Palestine conflict. European settler colonists massively dispossessing 800,000 people of their land, home, heritage, and country. And it did not end in 1948. That was only the beginning. Till today, the intention of the Israeli government is still the same as it was back then. The complete annexation of Palestine and the forced expulsion of its people. Settlements are still being built to take over the West Bank. Gaza is the world's largest open-air prison, 
Two million people surrounded by a foreign adversary, not allowed to leave at all, being deprived of food and exports, being bombed and raided regularly, running out of water, their infrastructure being constantly destroyed by Israel. Their hospitals, their schools, their stores, and their lives are all forfeit. It's going how it started, horribly, with the clear intention of the destruction of the Palestinian people. We've examined horrible atrocities today, but we've only scratched the surface. We haven't discussed so many things, and I have significantly simplified the parties involved here. But what we have discussed is enough for you to get a clear view of the situation. Understand this isn't a situation where there is a lot of ambiguity. There's a clear aggressor and a clear victim. Israel started out as a terrorist state, and it has kept up that legacy admirably. I'm incredibly indebted to Ilan Pape's book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. It covers everything I've talked about here and more. Ilan Pape is part of the New Historians, who are a group of Israeli his historians that examined records within the Israeli military archives and pieced together what happened during the Nakba. I would definitely recommend reading it if you're interested in knowing about this in more detail.